Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. I'm Matthew Feeney. Joining us today is Peter Van Doren. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and the editor of Regulation Magazine. Welcome to Free Thoughts again, Peter. Thanks for having me. I think this is your fifth time on the, on the Apparently show. Apparently, I'm on the, the, the top of the hit list. That would be the most of, of any guest. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about uh, kind of environmentalism and how it intersects with public policy and uh, and science. So the first question is sort of the, the big question that we're we'll discussing today, which is why are environmental policy conflicts so intractable? That's um, – <clears throat> as with all or many intellectual thinkings, that's not how I uh, thought about this when I first tackled the problem. And, and, uh, instead, I was – puzzled by the following stylized facts, which is um, if you're libertarian or if you're market-oriented, um, I found it puzzling that science was invoked by both sides of the political spectrum in policy conflicts but it had little to do with anything in markets. And the, so the following – so think about Whole Foods. Think about organic lettuce or organic anything. So for, if you're libertarian, should you have to justify your preferences as being based on something that is scientifically true? So for example, does it matter to the owners of Whole Foods whether or not anything they sell actually improves health or life expectancy or anything else that – the customers imagine such consumption does? The answer is no. Nor do the that the, the consumers think that it is true, but do they have to show studies to the owners of Whole Foods that if they take fish oil or if they eat organic lettuce or if they uh, if they can see the picture of the guy who raises the eggs that they consume? Do they have to show evidence from a scientific journal that that is shown – has been shown in a clinical trial or by econometric methods that that consumption does something good for the person who consumes it? So is another way of saying that is to say that Whole Foods' existence is not justified by whether or not it's – Scientific claims are correct. If you're a free market type, I mean, at least generally speaking, its existence is not justified by whether or not it's correct about its scientific claims. And in fact, not only that, there's a fair amount of scientific evidence that it doesn't that or that the health effects of uh, so-called uh, natural medicines or the the you know the homeopathic remedies, non-Western medicine, whatever. It, that there's no – that there's a surprising lack of evidence that those things actually matter for anything. But it doesn't stop people from buying them. It doesn't stop producers from producing them. It doesn't stop anybody from making gains to trade. So even though right of center people may be dubious of certain claims about the consumption of organic produce or meat or whatever – um, it doesn't stop those transactions from occurring and left of center people who may – and I'm using stereotypical correlations that may or may not be true. But They're if probably left, a little true. <laughs> if, if left of center people believe these things and they have a market that provides them, but they don't have to provide any evidence that in fact is – that is true. It's the same for psychics, right? Or tarot card readers, or all those people. And certainly, in a neoclassical economics framework, economists just start with preferences. We don't start with. We don't say you need scientific evidence that X works before you can buy it. Well, no, that's like that's this. This just not doesn't come up. In contrast, in public sector debate, both sides, both the left and the right, invoke science. When it's convenient for whatever they want, as the as the appropriate adjudicator of whether one's preferences, and here's where I'm going after sort of economic and or libertarian thought. I want to argue: Isn't it weird that right of center people say preferences can be served by market forces and can flourish in market settings, but once you enter the policy arena, we now 
want to make sure that what you're asking the public sector to do has scientific basis and both sides do this in different realms. Um, left of center people invoke sound science when they want to talk about climate change because they argue and believe that something called science and scientists are on their side, whatever, and we, we can t discuss what all these words mean. But right of center folks on the in the same in, in the environmental policy arena also invoke sound science when it comes to conventional air pollution, and they argue that there are many many studies that show that um, long term exposure to X and you feel like particulates or SO two or whatever. Um, does not – that is we're, we're, we're in a Laffer curve way of thinking about things. We're beyond the point of, of marginal – we're in the point of diminishing marginal returns, if you will, in ozone and particulate matter and SO2 reductions. We've cleaned up our act enough and we're now reducing things to the point that the gains in health, whatever they are, are very hard to find and – footnote, aren't worth it. They, they exceed the cost per life saved maybe and it's like, hmm, isn't that – so both sides want to invoke something called science as the priesthood that adjudicates whether your preferences are legitimate or not. Whereas again, if you're libertarian, it's not clear to me that – let's say I, I just want the environment to be cleaner. Just like I want again, I, I, I can't. You just want the environment to be cleaner. Does that mean you're not libertarian? Well, no. It's just a preference. And so, should one have to scientifically justify one's preferences? And I think most of us would say no. Well, no. I mean, strangely, we we we're schizophrenic. We sort of invoke it in in the public sector, and and there are parts of Cato that talk about sound science all the time, and I. Today I want to talk about why I'm, I'm not sure that's the right way to think about things. And in uh, – whereas in the private sector context, we would never ask anyone to justify their preferences uh, to be scientifically justified. So I want to explore where I think all this comes from and, and, and provide a, what I think is an economic explanation of why um, – environmental policy conflict is so intractable and talk about the role of science in that and then talk about the Coase theorem um, in, in economics as a, as, a, as, as a way to give us insight about what this conflict is about. But, um, but isn't it the fact that uh, when we're talking about environmentalism, externalities are sort of central to a lot of these conversations. So if I think I have good scientific basis for buying fresh fruit and vegetables and someone else thinks – I have good scientific evidence that I should buy ice cream and pizza and just eat that. I can go about saying, well, I'm going to continue buying fruit and vegetable and you know, you can do what you want because it's not hurting me. But the difference I think when you're talking about environmentalism is, well, it does matter um, if the factory is polluting and if the person running the factory doesn't think that it's actually polluting. So there seem to be uh, externalities at play here. And uh, do you think that the science should play a role in determining what – how damaging these kind of externalities are? Well, let me let me separate those two questions and say they're different. Um, mm -hmm. you've, you've hit on something that's very important which is the key to market provision of things and why we don't require and why we don't even think it's culturally legitimate to ask people to have a scientific basis for the purchase of whatever weird thing they want to purchase is that – your purchase of something, even if I find it disgusting, it doesn't rise to the level of conflict because it's – that's why we have the term private goods, private consumption. The – we have cultural you know, a stigma attached to people who are too nosy <laughs> about other people's stuff. And, and although that those walls are decreasing with urbanization, but well, generally you need a, that you need some sort of reason to be able to take over someone's choices that it has to do right. with some sort. It remind so uh, Matt Matthew's is, point remind me of uh, there is I think the the fruit durian. Are you familiar with the fruit, the fruit durian? Yeah, it's called durian. D u r i a n. It's 
the smelliest oh. fruit on the planet, and like there are laws Speaking about of not, not being able to eat that on like, the subway. It's like it's yeah. like the gooey center of a melon. It's a Southeast Asian thing. Yeah. Uh, but that maybe you know. So, but you need the smell to be, you know, right. be able to interfere with someone's basic choice of what fruit they want to eat, whether so, it's not scientifically or not. So both of you have hit upon the important an important difference, and um, that is joint consumption, public goods. Right. The the trying to figure out what what level of and what kind of public consumption to have it's, it requires conflict adjudication between people that doesn't exist um with with private goods and you point out if your if the factory is consuming its level it what it thinks is the appropriate level of environmental amenities which is not many and the neighborhood disagrees then how are we going to what do we do about that conflict but again, an economist would say, right, that – and here's where the Coase theorem comes in and things like that, which is let's talk about property rights. Who has the right to what and then when do rights interfere? And then if we disagree, can I buy out your right to do whatever it is you think you have the right to do? And the insight of Coase was is that it, if if – there are markets for trading in nastiness, then it doesn't matter who has the right to impose something on somebody else. What matters is, is that that right is exists, it, it, that it, it, it exists, that it is recognized as legally tradable and that then the trading can begin and if you don't like something – you can buy out someone's right to do whatever it is they're doing that you don't like. Well, let's re so let's let's review that just uh, for those who have not listened. We have some other episodes with you where we talked about the coast theorem, but for people who have not listened to those episodes, and we'll put those links in the show notes. But uh, to, to use an analogy of pollute uh, two neighbors, or uh, or with, with either loud music or run off from someone's. Yard or something like this, where you have an externality. The, the idea here is that they can bargain, and it doesn't matter who has the right initially. Uh, in a, it, it, that they can bargain about. Oh, this is how much it's worth it to me to play loud music, and I'll pay you, and everyone's happy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who actually has the right to play loud music. That's basically Coase's point, correct? That if rights exist and they're easily tradable, and and. The initial assignment of rights is not such a large portion of one's wealth portfolio that the demand for and or the supply of that right alters one's willingness to pay. That as long as the thing in question is at the margin and not – it doesn't change everything, then it doesn't matter who owns the initial rights for the eventual efficient equilibrium – how much noxious whatever is present once we come to a final bargain. All that matters is that if you have rights, you are wealthier than if you don't have rights, i.e. payments flow from the person who doesn't have rights to the person who does have rights or in the alternative, it flows the other way around. But in the end, the same amount of odor of melon or sparks in the air or <clears throat> music you don't like or whatever that's publicly consumed in the environment, that equilibrium outcome of stuff is identical. That That's the strong version of the Coase theorem. And again, it's not a claim. It's not a positive claim about how the world really works. It's rather a logical exercise so that if the real world doesn't seem to be that way, you then can infer that you must be violating one of the assumptions of the Coase theorem and that's it, it, it and therefore instructs you as, as to what's going on. So, so let me give you an example of where sound science that were initial rights didn't matter and the eventual outcome was the same and it was a policy struggle and no one in no one commissioned Cato or Brookings or anyone else to find out what science said was the right allocation, initial allocation. <clears throat> so it's before the current digital phone, cell phone system, there was a duopoly in every city. So very early cell phone technology was expensive and bulky and there were only two franchises per city, okay, two. 
the rights, believe it or not, the rights to those franchises in each city were given away by the FCC in a lottery. You're talking about the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum rights. Is that what you're saying? Some the, portion the, of the spectrum? There were two – right. There were two – franchise frequency rights per city pre-1990 and the rights to those were given away in a lottery run by the FCC and anyone could participate. I mean anyone. So lawyer – I mean people read the Federal Register and then they had everybody send in little postcards so like or whatever. Mrs. Ann Mabel from Grandmothers, Des Moines, anybody Iowa could, could participate. Just and, like the Powerball. Exactly. Okay. And some non-telecom Entities won initial rights to the FCC – to these uh, duopoly cell phone franchise rights in major cities. But no one then invoked sound science to say that, oh my god, that will cause – that will alter the fate of human history and we won't have cell phones because we've just given the rights to operation of this thing to someone who doesn't know how to operate a cell phone company. The people who won who weren't companies, you know what they did? Sold them they sold yeah. them to the companies. <laughs> so that's an example of the Coase theorem working where government decided initial rights randomly and then allowed transfers and the market worked and we had cell phones. One person was wealthier and the telecom company was poorer and there's some rent seeking that goes on to, sort of, to try to rig these – Initial – well, now we have auctions and now there's sometimes – there's little set aside. So there's a little politics left. But basically now we just have cell phone auctions and people bid. And grandmas don't win the bids. They don't have – it's just not worth their time to try to, right? So con contrast that with anything in the environment like should we drill in Anwar or should we – whatever. Should we have a CO2 tax or not or any of these conflicts? Ooh, now notice we – there are conflicts. Most people don't realize they're actually about the initial allocation of rights to do stuff. And I think – and here's where the positive part of my talk comes in. This is Peter's explanation of why conflict – or across policy venues – the venues that have the most intractable conflicts are those that – where some aspect of the Coase theorem is violated. And the one thing that I think is violated in, in the environmental area is that the participants believe that whoever gets initial rights then won't trade them. Well, I can imagine a lot of uh, environmentalists at this point in, your, in this discussion thinking, well, no amount of willing donations to some sort of environmentalist fund will ever be able to compete with BP or ExxonMobil. If they discover oil in a beautiful part of a rainforest, they're worth billions of dollars. No amount of environmentally friendly you know, $10 donations are going to add up to compete with um, outbidding rights to mm -hmm. that area. So what's the response here? Is it – You're right. Yeah. You're, I mean well, what you've discovered is that – the good student always figures everything out before um, I say what it is and and the public – we're back to joint. The, so the whatever deal – so remember the Trevor's initial discussion of the Coase theorem was a two-person discussion. Mm -hmm. There are no public good characteristics to the bargain mm -hmm. if only two parties are involved. If many parties are, are involved, then we have the classic – so the Coasean bargain in that – context itself has enormous public good characteristics. If you didn't contribute to the fund for the purchase of the rights from the entity that you wanted to purchase the rights from, if you didn't contribute but the bargain still took place because lots of other people gave to a crowdfunding source and raised money to buy out the Koch brothers or if you're – whatever. Uh, if if all of that took place and you didn't contribute, you could still enjoy whatever benefits ensued from the bargain without paying. And since everyone in equilibrium, so it's the non-exclusion element. You so, I mean even well, the now there are benefits it, of like just knowing. I mean, it's there. Aside from clean air, which you could have real benefits from, but but you can think. exclude whatever benefits arise from any true changes in exposure 
that make your health better if it's conventional or no environmental damages from CO2. If you, if, if you don't participate in – as Matt said, if you don't give to the fund but the fund still raises enough money to buy out some refineries rights to, um, to produce fossil fuels – you still benefit from that bargain and that's the free riding problem. So we're – so what I'm trying to do here is hone – make everyone much more precise about what it is we need to think about in environmental policy, which is, hmm, so we just, we just need to have a more robust market for the trading of stuff but recognize that even if that exists, only those with intense preferences – who are willing to pay and hope that others benefit and they don't mind. They, in other words, they want the world to change so much that they're willing to pay even though they know that free riders – but notice the same thing is true now. Think of political contributions. So the fight that could be an explicit rights trading regime in a Peter world, instead of directly having it a, a regime in which – Strong environmentalists and strong pro-pollution people, if I could describe them in that, in effect, use their extensive wealth to buy out the rights of the other that they don't like. Instead, they all now contribute to political campaigns to have the same struggle. Yeah, I think uh, you know, hearing this, <laughs> e I, I – Even though the benefits that – Tom Strayer, is that his name on the – pro-environmental? I mean, Tim or Tom. Tom think, yeah. and, and then people on our side for the opposite point of view. Whatever world they create with their political contributions, you and I get to enjoy without – I've never contributed to a political campaign. But I get to enjoy or not like whatever world is created by that political fight. And so I'm – Again, the economist in me says that libertarians, instead of having this proxy political fight over what is a distributional wealth matter, just have rights exist and have them traded even for public goods because the free rider problem exists. In, but I mean if, if you take it seriously, I don't know why there are any political contributions, <laughs> right? In what way? You mean because, because – do you understand? If, if I, th I thought you just explained why there would be political contributions no, because they can't – I can free – in other words – Oh, because everyone are, can free ride. They're, but they're, they're but very there could wealthy be, people supporting both the left and the right. But only What's, sizable political – I mean a lot of people can free ride on sizable political contributions. So there would be – I people. can free ride on – Bernie Sanders if, – if, if Bernie Sanders wins – I will consume whatever policy outcomes he creates even though I have not given to his campaign. So, but when you said you didn't know why there are any political contributions, I mean on one level I thought we explained – In a very econ, public goods oriented way of looking at the world, it's not clear why people give to things where the enjoyment of the benefits cannot be restricted to those who are giving. Well, the, okay, well let me let – me, Rephrase this. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. But so one thing I took from the question that Matthew asked about about the fear of like the what would happen if the oil people were allowed to just you know drill wherever is that one way you could interpret this is one of the reasons why environmentalists in particular perhaps want to move something from a market question to a political question is basically because they think they'll lose the market question. Well, well they think the, they that, think if. The following. Jer Jerry Taylor and I once wrote an op-ed about why not give Anwar to the Sierra Club? Yeah. Give it. Just – but they own it. They have property rights to the Atlant Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. Why do the – why do people on the right say, oh my god, that would be just horrible. Don't do that. Peter and Jerry, you're crazy. Da, da, da. We got lots of hate mail on this. We said that means you think they won't ever trade off any initial ownership of anything they view as sacred for any amount of money at all. And then flip it. That make them choose basically. And and flip it, which is let's have oil companies have property raised and more. And if people are that serious, I mean, ignoring the public goods problems that we're talking about, couldn't you? Couldn't you? 
start the 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 social media chatterbox and saying let's buy out the evil doers who own the, the Kickstarter, the whatever, yeah. okay, whatever, crowdsourcing yeah. to raise money. And if an, a, a small contribution from enough people, Bernie Sanders style, can raise a lot of money, right? If everyone kicks but in. So, but so when but I'm East, s- but you're right. Both sides think. That's well, at least the environmentalists who might have politicized this first. I mean, in some way, I guess the initial allocation was, but both they, sides they think, think that, that they this, would lose, right? And so, and so, then they choose a different method of distribution that they think they have, but more influence over than a pure market distribution, which would be the political method of distribution. And then they give contributions because they think they can influence that more than even being though, able to buy it out. Even though, to Matt's point, both. Politics and raising money to buy out rights. Both of those have public good characteristics. That's all I. They're was, free riders, as you're saying. One can one or the can be non-participants consume whatever outcome happens, regardless of whether they gave or not. So is this? So are you? It does seem like environmentalists, in particular, speak about. I mean, it kind of could have upset economists. They they speak as if things have unlimited value and that they don't want to participate in any sort of trading because the act of trading they find defense, they find defensive uh, the, the world and all these yes. things like this, which is just aggravating from an economic standpoint because Correct. then you don't then they're really just using political power to try and advance their purposes, which themselves – I mean how much they want to participate in politics is their own trade-off. You say, look, how much do you really like Anwar? You know, you've never been. You're never w- going. Wouldn't you sell off some of the rights for money so you could do – you could create an endowment for environmental causes as opposed to having no money and just a mission? Well, the, there is a one uh, – the Autobahn Society did own – there were private wildlife bird refuges. Refuge, uh, refugees. Ref, 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 sorry. It's not refugees. No. Refuges. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> wildlife areas in Louisiana. <laughs> we, we will look up the correct pronunciation afterwards. Uh, um, they owned – they were privately owned in effect bird and wildlife Sanctuary. environmental provision and they then also – quietly sold drilling rights to natural gas producers in Louisiana. Well, once right of center people exposed this um, apostasy, they shut it down. Which is very unfortunate. Well, yeah. I wanted to see – you thought I might say that they were willing to sell. But once it was publicized because of the outrage of their primary core supporters, they found that Economic-style trade-offs, a whole lot of money for a little bit of our land in return for money, the major constituents of the Autobahn Society were outraged by this and shut it down. So, so that does not bode well for my dream of let's explicitly have trading of well, public good emission rights and let things fall where they may. Well, so I, I'm glad that you brought up birds because before this podcast, I was thinking about uh, uh, so, uh, environmentalists particularly concerned about particular species, and of course, species move. So uh, whales and birds might migrate thousands of miles, and uh, I, I do hear sometimes that these sort of questions have to be answered internationally, and that uh, you know a skeptic might think of the Van Doren solution as, as um, impractical because how could property rights be allocated among whale pods and oh. flocks of birds and things like this. So if I want to save the whales, how does Peter Van Doren help me? Well, there are ITQ. I mean, there are, internet, there are fishing quota rights regimes, um, but they are run by nations. But, but these nations, Iceland in particular, has the most famous. They have 200-mile zones. But that's for fish that are catchable, not for fish that are – no, that are deemed uh, to to have – what's the right word? C- characteristics as humans value so much Bio, that there's – Biodiversity. That or, there's strong normative uh, um, shunning, if you will, if you – Like dolphins or something like that. Well, seal, the seal, 
seal killings by native being, uh, this is Canadians a, d- and that also Japanese being, whale hunts. Being cute is a very good ad- adaptation in that regard because jellyfish don't get a lot of supporters. Well, but nor, dolphins. Nor insects. Yeah, nor I mean, insects for that matter. Yeah, so yeah. we – but I'm not – Surprised that I mean we shouldn't. Uh, right. So th- the, but yes, Matt's right. That is certain things that transcend nation states. Then create. Then you need the UN to have. But again, no one wants to have the optim the right amount of whales and then kill the right. No one's talking. I mean, it, it, it's just uh, uh, so. But for. F- for commercial fish, uh, there are nation-state regimes with bio- – where biologists determine the, quote, optimal harvest each year given what they think they know about reproduction rates and sustainability. And then those fishing rights are owned by people and then they can be sold in secondary markets. And then once the catch is – once you've taken your catch – that, then the fishing stops and the race to the commons is ended and overfishing ends and things. Like. So uh, certainly regulation, my journal has published many articles on fishing transferable quota regimes and, and how they do and don't work. The United States is rather backwards in that regard. Iceland is the uh, primary. Well, I, so that, that your last comment made me think, well, wouldn't um, fishermen know a thing or two about – Overfishing and allowing fish to reproduce. Uh, I mean, so uh, or are fishermen just particularly short-sighted? <laughs> well, it's not. It's that there's a com. It's that take as much as you can. Yes. I mean, the New England, the New England cod, cod fishery yeah. is not a. It, it's if you, if you think that through voluntary mm-hmm. normative behavior within a small community, they could restrain the fishing to equal. Reproduction possibilities. The data don't don't seem to support right. that. They, the, the cod are gone, and they've appealed politically to when Barney Frank. I mean, he that was his district. He represented the Fall River fishermen, and he was always trying to make sure they weren't hemmed in by these kinds of schemes that I'm describing. And then finally, it all just played out, and now they're. They're no more. I mean, they're gone. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go back to the, the science question because we're talking about why and when should science enter public policy debates, uh, and what and how. so I'm so as an econ- I mean, so here's again a positive claim by me. So I've asserted that what I observe is that science is invoked as an adjudicating thing. In those policy conflicts where I think the parties believe that initial allocation of rights, as you've said, determines the eventual outcome and they and thus instead of having an explicit discussion about the distribution of wealth and who ought to have it and why, we instead have a a science discussion which is a backdoor way to not talk about wealth well, is this, and, is this a different and outcomes. Way of, a different way of saying so. Uh, maybe we're saying the same thing, but I've always thought that, especially when it comes to environmental preferences, that you have a, a very interesting problem of uh, throughout the world, preferences will butt heads. You know, if someone will say, "I like tigers this much," and I like tigers as a as a beautiful, majestic thing running through the forest, and someone else says, "I like tigers as rugs on my floor," right? And then the and then <laughs> and then the question of how do you adjudicate those disputes now? One thing that we often do in public policy debates is we try we we try to make other people's preferences our own in some way. We try to say, or try to sorry, try to change their preferences to, uh, to, to ours, our own. right? Yeah. And so we try and say, well, you because know, on one level you can't if you just say tigers are cool, and that's like saying red's my favorite color, and and so you're saying well that doesn't really work. So I need something more than tigers are cool. If I want only if I'm the only person on the planet who thinks tigers are cool, so I'm trying to fight against the whole rest of the world. Uh, and people are killing tigers for rugs. I'm the only one who thinks they're as cool as I think they do, but I don't have that much money to actually 
pay or get people to be convinced to preserve the tiger. So I, even if I try to put my money where my mouth is, I can't save the tiger. So my next thing is to try and change their preference for tigers. It's like this is how important tigers are. They're not they're not just cool animals. They're really important to bio their biodiversity. There, you know, the whole world will will suffer if there is a problem because they're the apex predator and there will be a problem in the food chain. So other things that you care about will be will be undercut unless we protect tigers. And that and so yes. and my next goal if I can't act as myself in the market is to act politically and then override, try and override all their preferences in some way. And that's where the science can come in Well, it's, to change from tigers are cool to tigers are really important and here's my science for why. That is, are we saying the same thing yes, about I, the initial property it's, rights? Yes, it's, it's, if 500 years ago, kings and queens had, had um, wizards and priests that wizards, really, or whatever. I mean, they, Peter they, is the they, smartest person I know. No, so if no, he tells no, me wizards whatever, existed, they, they I want to go back to that. They, 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 <laughs> they had, they had entities to whom they asked advice and, and expertise about when to go to war and when to do X and when to do Y, and we invoked God as a reason. It's so elites need things to get masses to go along with whatever it is they want to do. And in my view, science has become an opaque thing that most people don't really know how it works. They, it's important. It was the courses that they didn't do well in, in high school or college. And oh, so if so, if if think of it, following two stories, right? Which is environmentalist tries to raise money to buy out the rights of fossil fuel producers to produce. Story number two, scientists say, as you said, we are doomed if we don't stop this. Wow, those are two different narratives, same result. My – right, the econ way sounds slimy and weird and we don't like them and why should we have to buy out, blah, 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 blah. And I'm saying in the FCC auction, it was pretty weird who got the rights. But we didn't – no one said let's invoke science to say grandma shouldn't have initial allocation of telecom rights and therefore we shouldn't have to buy her out. So I'm just struck as an observer that we have these different normative moral criteria about what is or isn't slimy depending on the policy venue and I'm intrigued by that. Then my normative prescription is I think we could lower the temperature and I also think this misuses science. I think science has nothing – not nothing but it is a necessary input but never a sufficient input to any policy question of any kind. In the end, everything is costs and benefits. It's – well, that's still Why science. Why are we doing no, – no. I mean it, it, science you can use is science to measure. Science is I am – if we continue to emit in this way, life expectancy will go down by three years. And then you add the cost and benefits. Is that a – how do I want to think about that? Well, if, if whatever I'm doing is really – so think of smoking. To many people, smoking makes no sense. To smokers, now some smokers regret, right? But many smokers say, yeah, it's gonna, I'm going to reduce my life expectancy, but I actually get something out of this, right? Or it's worth it. Or so, you know, the demographics, I mean, the, the David Bowie's death and then other rock, I mean, the, the Eagles guy, I mean, it looks like the worst thing, the worst occupation to go to. If I'm a parent, what don't you want your kids to do? Rock star? Yeah, <laughs> rock and roll. That is not, just like the song. I mean, but you, it's sex, better to burn out than fade away, <laughs> Peter. It is better to burn out than fade away. But you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so talk about the thing that reduces life expectancy the most if I read the newspaper correctly lately. It's pa not anything pa it's not cords. anything we're talking Distortion about. Pedals. It's a, it's everything that stereotypical movies about the 50s and 60s. The parent the, the blackboard jungle. The, yeah, the, the the movies were right. This is going to Lower your life expectancy by a lot. OK. So no one invokes – I mean you see what I'm saying? Which is – so 
I think the answer to everything, because I'm hyper econ oriented, is to have rights for everything and to have trading for everything, including things that have public good aspects to them. And then the conflicts direct, i.e., we are fighting over th- what collective outcome we are enjoying, and let's not do it through politics. Let's in effect, try to see how much everyone can raise to have what kind of environment. And so I want the the right to make the planet dirtier as well as cleaner and then let have people put their money where their mouth is. And I, the diversion of all this money into po- to having political fights as an indirect way to create our future, which is what, what level of pollution do you really want? Um, I just find odd and frustrating. Well, so what's your uh, take on what what I sometimes call the the the, the ignorance narrative, which is people who are pro environment will often say because you've discussed preferences, is that people can't make a um, accurate decision about their own preferences because they're ignorant. If someone says, "Well, look, people don't know what high fructose corn syrup really does to them. People don't know what smoking cigarettes really does to them." If I was able, perhaps through legislation, to inform people. Then we could maybe have a discussion. But the fact is that people are ignorant and don't know enough to make the right choices. <laughs> um, Big side. It's, no, it's a good – I mean I, I, I could go into a rant but I won't. Um, it, I should take – I mean – I mean feel free. No, no, no. <laughs> you are correct that, at, that it is a common comment. Then we're back to – we're back to science having to adjudicate what one's preferences are. And actually, let me give you uh, – I'm thinking on the fly here. Kip Viscusi, right, is, is Dr. Risk. He spent his entire life – his dissertation was about risk. His, his, he's the guy – He's the Vanderbilt? Or, or? He's, he was at Harvard Law School and now he's, he's a, the professor of everything at Vanderbilt. Um, and he has spent his entire life uh, – he's the person who created what we now call the cost per life saved metric and literature that follows. Uh, we've talked about that in, in podcast, so I won't – basically he infers from risky job data how much people need to be paid to accept known risks and then infers from that what – how much the government should spend on publicly provided risk prevention ranging from guardrails, i.e. very cost effective, to certain kinds of OSHA things in the workplace where we reduce exposure to things that really probably don't change life expectancy, i.e. cost per life saved of billions of dollars. So you end up with this number which is it looks like from market data that people value a statistical life at somewhere between 8 to $10 million. So Viscusi is then interviewed. I mean he we, – we know from epidemiological data what the life reduction is for smokers. We know it's somewhere in the order of four to six years. Then Viscusi has interviewed smokers. He said, what do you, what do you think? What's the consequence of your behavior? The average estimate from smokers is 20 years. So, so they over so, so, so they so really they, like cigarettes is what we can presume. Well, they, <laughs> yes. Yes. So in the, in a I mean so we've had what since 1964 my, my entire lifetime we have had I've been exposed to smoking as stupid smoking right public service and da, 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 da. so we're now down to a population of smokers that is rather residual and it, clearly they are intensely into it because there's social negatives to do it and all that and yet they still do it. And so when, when they're interviewed by people like Viscusi, that's what they, they come up with. They think the consequences of their behavior are actually much more destructive than they are. And this is on average. There's a huge variance. So some smokers die of 50 and some smoke it and, and – my wife's uncle was 84 and smoking in the hospital and he smoked since he was 16. I mean that doesn't imply that anywhere near the population average but big variance. So if 
there's a at least an anecdotal policy venue where the claim that the people involved don't understand how dangerous the thing is that we need to protect them from, if anything, they seem to be overly concerned. Well, yeah. My, whenever I um, hear this, I think they, th- these people seem to imagine that people have a goal to live a zero-risk life. And the fact is that people – like smoking and like eating the occasional donut and like playing dangerous sports and all the rest of it. Uh, and they even fully <laughs> – you know, even fully informed people can make uh, bad decisions. Well, subjectively, my judgment would be that they're bad decisions. But, we we uh, did yeah. have a uh, – we I ran an article in regulation several years ago on not externalities but internalities, the internalities of smoking. You mean is this is – this, oh, I, I, I'm going to guess at this one. Is this – Treating future selves as different people that you're putting costs on that you're not familiar with about what that future self is. That's because that's super philosophical and it's nifty and I like that. Okay. <laughs> He's, Peter's nodding. So if it, it can, Jonathan uh, Gruber is the health economist at MIT. The famous Obama. Right. You care, uh, calculated that the appropriate tax on cigarettes was a dollar. Oh, gee, I'm gonna. I can't remember. A dollar a cigarette? That would make sense, right? Yeah, much, much it's higher. Pretty high. V- very high. Or was it a dollar? Pa- no, it has to be a dollar a cigarette. I'd have to go back and look at the article. It's Twenty bucks sure. a pack. Maybe we'll put that in. Yeah. But, and we had Gruber, and then we had response by Viscusi, and then we had Tom Fiery, who was trained in philosophy, the managing editor of Regulation, respond about. What Matt's saying and, and Trevor, which is the younger self that's risk taking, and then people my age who are saying, "Oh, when I was young, I was stupid." So, would the older self want to impose on the younger self some wisdom that the younger self didn't exhibit? And then Tom wrote about which is truer, which which is should should older selves have any rights over that, that younger selves, the even question, the same yeah. person? Yeah, and. No, that's I don't. That's outside of my league. And uh, but that does I, uh, get us it, into the question, which which this would be a, a different podcast, and we have actually done an episode on this with uh, Bill Glott, who's a philosopher on libertarian paternalism. But I think that we're getting very close to yes. this. Um, not to open up a huge bag of worms as we come to the end here, but but basically one of the science things, and maybe this tells us a lot about actually where public policy is now, uh, new paternalism. Which is now to tell you that your preferences are wrong because I have now sort of scientific explanations for why your preferences are wrong in saying that everyone says they want to quit and they don't actually quit. So therefore, we infer that they really do want to quit even though revealed preferences say that they're not quitting. So now we're going to do things to them to engineer their choices to make sure that they quit smoking or eating cheeseburgers or exercise more or donate their organs or all these sort of things. That seems also like an element of science in this uh, that could be useful for public policy making. And so early uh, – because I'm so into economics, what you – the reason I sort of huffed initially at Matt's question was because – Everything in my bones say you you start with people you uh, you start with people's preferences. Now, behavioral economics, of course, is is the whole raison de da da the French word right the whole guts of behavioral economics is exactly what Matt said, which is it looks like in a variety of settings, venues, whatever that people don't seem to know what's good for them. <laughs> They 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 can't maximize the financial markets. They're not they they think they are dealing with risk, but they don't have life insurance. You know they they just make bad investments. They're just, they don't, yeah. don't. So let's help them out. Smarter <laughs> people need to help them out, whatever that is. And so people like me say, oh man, no, that's just just that's just mis-. You know we don't do that. I mean, it's, so it's but, getting into, but it's not a good. I mean, I. Uh, we need to deal with that in a whole nother yeah, discussion. But, yeah, but it, it right. is true. Peter is sitting here in this chair. But he, he visibly quakes when you <laughs> ask him about anything that says that maybe preferences aren't aren't the real preferences, which I which I do too. And so it, it does seem very paternalistic. But we'll, we'll, but I have to admit that the I'm not. Dis, I mean, the anomalies that the behavioralists have discovered, I have to admit, exist as a positive scientist. I can't say. 
oh, wow, savings rates are really high. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> so the therefore – but I don't think – just as I say nothing comes from science, I think nothing comes from behavioral economics in the following sense. There's no policy therefore, which is if we see under savings therefore – what? Well, then we need separate normative discussion about whether changing the default condition of a 401k sign up, which I mean basically in the hallway if you ask me, is there anything wrong with, make, with making people opt automatically out. sign up for saving and then they have to opt out if they don't? Is there any horrible mischief in that? And the answer is no, nah, probably not. That's that's OK. But – Something else, yes. We'll have to book – we'll book right now our future episode <laughs> with Peter Van Doren about behavioral economics. Uh, but to wrap up this episode uh, and, and f finish up on the environmental question, uh, what's, the, what's the takeaway here do you think? Well, I just the, – the, so my message is, is that Whenever one hears sound science being invoked, I want you to realize that that to me indicates the possibility of large gains to trade. When, one, when a side says, my studies show what you want to impose on me is way too expensive relative to what it's worth, oh, Peter says, ha ha, then it doesn't, then Okay, then buy them out. It, it, whenever someone says they, they've got scientific studies on their side, you just open up your checkbook and you say, if you imposed your regulations on me because of your sound science, it would cost me a gazillion. Can I pay you anything less than a gazillion to go away and be happy? That's, what, that's the bottom line I want people to think of from, from our talk today. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.